You're listening to the Life with Old Dogs podcast, and I'm your host, Dawn Mimna, primary caretaker of all of our wonderful senior German Shepherds right here at Woody's Place Senior German Shepherd Sanctuary. Hey there, folks. Welcome to the first full episode of the Life with All Dogs podcast, season one. Um, This season, we are discussing the origins of Woody's Place or how Woody's Place came to be, how and why Woody's Place came to be. Uh, So let's just start right off the bat with, with one question that I am asked frequently and have been over the years. And that question is, why senior German Shepherds? Why do we solely focus on German shepherds eight years and older to provide sanctuary for? And the answer is twofold. Number one, because Woody was a 10-year-old German shepherd when I adopted him. And this sanctuary is in his memory. Um, I realized through him how many German shepherds eight years and older find themselves abandoned, destitute, displaced, whatever, that needs somewhere to call home. And if anyone knows anything about German shepherds, it's they are they are very very loyal to their family. I mean, they're not good being passed around from this home to that home, from this person to that person. So, it was very important to me to create the sanctuary for German shepherds 8 years and older um, in honor of of Woody. The second reason is because German Shepherds are what I know and love. Um, You know, that being said, I've had other dogs. I love all dogs. I love all animals. I mean, anybody who knows me knows that, you know, we we have cats here that we've rescued. We have five cats that, um, you know, call Woody's Place home. We have a feral cat colony outside that we care for that rely on us for medical care and food and shelter. Um, I have, I personally have, oh my gosh, I don't even know how many chickens. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to say I'm almost embarrassed. I have a lot and, um, a couple of goats. So, you know, I, I love all animals. That's, that's definitely, um, definitely my thing animals. But when I decided to create a sanctuary, I, I knew I was going to have to narrow it down to something, um, and something I was good at, and something I was drawn to, because, um, you know, sanctuary life, it it is like a job. It's more than a full-time job. It's 24-7. So I knew it was going to have to be something that I wasn't going to have to push myself to do. I I was going to want to do, want to do it every day, 24-7. And for me, that's Senior German Shepherds. I truly, my heart lies with, with Senior German Shepherds. So there you have it. The two reasons that Woody's Place is for German Shepherds eight years and older. Number one, Woody. And number two, because it's what I know and love. So, all right. Now that I have that out there, anyone else who wants to know the answer to that question, I can direct them right to this podcast. How great is that going to be? So let me back up here quite a ways um, because I wanted to discuss my love for German Shepherds or how, how it came to be. Um, so we are going to back way up here to, to the late seventies. Um, I was about nine or 10 years old when my family got a German Shepherd puppy. Now folks, I, I just have to say right off the bat here. Yes. My family bought a German Shepherd that was the last dog they ever bought. Every German Shepherd, every Poodle, every Roddy after that, every Pit Bull after that, they were all adopted. So um, for me personally, I bought a one German Shepherd in my lifetime and all the rest were adopted. So I, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't complain. I don't nag. I don't lecture. I don't scold anyone who goes to a breeder and buys a dog so long as they're going to care for that dog for the rest of their life and that dog's not going to end up in a shelter or rescue or displaced or anything like that. That's not my thing. 
I leave that to someone else. Would I do it again? Would I run to a breeder and buy a dog again? Absolutely not because I know better now, but I'm not going to be up on a soapbox lecturing anyone not to. That's that's not my place. So anyway, um, back in the in the late 70s, my family got a German Shepherd. She was the traditional black and tan German Shepherd. Um, her name was Maxine. And of course, she was just this adorable black and tan little fluff ball with a floppy ears and big paws and puppy belly and puppy breath and little puppy teeth. And she was adorable. And we all loved her. And of course, you know, Maxine, um, she grew up and um, she was, I was captivated by her. I mean, we had, we had poodles, but, and I love them. They were great too. But I was captivated by Maxine from the moment she came into our home. I, I was just taken by her so much so that I wanted to be with her all the time. Um, Now, as I got older and she got older, now we're talking the 80s, the early 80s, Maxine was outside in our yard a lot. We had a fenced in yard. And, you know, we lived in a neighborhood in the suburbs of Philadelphia and lots of people had family dogs and lots of their dogs would be outside during the day. Um, And Maxine was no different. I mean, that's not to say she didn't come inside the house, but, you know, she was outside a lot in the dog yard and or in the backyard. And she had a a dog box, a huge dog box. My gosh, this this I don't know who built this dog box, but it was this huge, sturdy, solid wood uh, dog house. I can't even call it a dog box. It was a straight up house for her. And. Um, she, she would lay in there, you know, of course, to keep out of the sun and there was hay in there and all that stuff. And, um, I spent a lot of time in that dog box with her. Um, number one, because I loved her and I wanted to be with her, but number two, because, um, I did not have like, I didn't have the traditional happy go lucky childhood, um, and I'm, I'm not criticizing anyone, my parents or anything like that, but you know, my parents were divorced that, that really wasn't easy. Wasn't ever really sure where I fit in. Um, and, uh, I had, I had, um, uh, learning disabilities. So from a young age, I had, I had, uh, well, from the beginning, really, I, I just had a hard time with, um, with learning. Like I, I really couldn't, um, in a, in a structured setting, like a school setting, um, I, I had trouble focusing. I had trouble sitting still. I couldn't really focus. I couldn't really comprehend. I would open my mouth knowing what I wanted to say and just a jumble of words would come out and I'd sound like a big dingling, um, you know, and, and it was embarrassing. Um, not only that, but I was also like kind of physically awkward. Um, I wasn't really coordinated um, you know, to, to play sports or anything like that. I had like bad hand eye coordination. Um, and I I really didn't have like great (laughs) fashion sense either. Um, you know, I, I didn't really spend a whole lot of time on my hair. And even if I did, I didn't know how to wear it. I would, you know, as I got older, tried to put makeup on, but I I really didn't know what I was doing. And I'd walk around looking like happy, the clown, you know, it was, it was really, um, a tough time for me. And it was very, it was very lonely for me. Um, because I I was painfully aware that I wasn't the same as, you know, other girls, my age or most girls, my age. Um, one thing I did have going for me was I was always friendly and outgoing. So I, I did have friends. It's not that I didn't have friends, but I really didn't get to see them a whole lot outside of school. So um, I was I was very lonely. I was very lonely and I was very self-conscious. Um, I had no, no self-esteem, like zero self-esteem because I, I just felt for sure whatever I was going to do or say was going to be wrong. Um, I later found out that I have ADHD. That's one of my disabilities, um, one of my learning disabilities. And, and you know, it all kind of made sense to me. Um, once I got older and then I was put in special education classes and that was great because I got the, um, academic help that I needed, but it was bad in the sense that there, there were no girls in my class, absolutely none. 
And I wouldn't have a girl, another girl in my class until 11th grade. And surprise, surprise, she didn't want anything to do with me. So it was it was just really um, a, an awkward time for me. And, you know, I wouldn't want to relive it to save my life. But um, Maxine was my my best friend. She was my confidant. I sat in that dog box with her. And I, I tell you what. I told many of story. I cried many of tears. I told her my my fears, my my joys, um, what I wanted to do in life if I could. You know, she knew everything about me more than anyone else. And um, I'll tell you what, she she must have liked my company because she could have gotten up and gone out that dog door any minute and she, any chance she got. And she she didn't. She stayed with me and she listened. So, um, I would sit in her dog box and like I said, I I really couldn't sit. So I would like, I would be, I would be brushing her. I'd be petting her. I'd be fluffing her hay. I'd be knocking cobwebs down for her. If there was a spider in her dog box, I, I put it out the dog door for, I mean, I was like even fidgety in that dog box. But again, she, she, um, she stayed with me and she loved me. She loved me unconditionally. And I, I knew that. And, um, what little bit of confidence I did develop later on was really, Honestly, it was like in part due to her because, you know, I at least had someone, even if she was furry and four legged, to to at least let me vent and um, say the things that I really needed to say that I didn't feel comfortable saying to anyone else. So she was a godsend to me. And I became a mom at a young age. I was 17 when I had my son. And then I was 19 when I had my daughter. And I was late with her. I was like five days late with my daughter. And four days before my daughter was born, I had gone back to my family home for a visit. And Maxine was under the deck behind the house. She, You know, the deck, the porch deck, whatever you want to call it, that was attached to the house. She had crawled under there. And um, she wasn't doing well. She wasn't doing well at all. And I, I just had a feeling, you know, that that was... She was probably going to die. So um, I crawled under. <laughs> I crawled under the deck to be with her. And I mean, it was hard because I had this big beach ball belly and I was crying and I couldn't see and it was dark under there. But she was under there and she wouldn't come out. And uh, so I sat under there with her. Actually, I laid next to her in the dirt. And I, I told her just how much I loved her and that, you know, she was she was the love of my life and she was my best friend and that um even though i was going to miss her that it that it was okay to go i i wanted her to know that it was okay to go she didn't she didn't have to stick around for anyone if she you know wasn't feeling well and um that yeah it it was okay um and so I think it might have even been later that day or the next day my stepfather was able to get her out from underneath the deck and took her to the vet and sure enough, you know, she had she had passed away. So it wasn't a surprise. I mean, she was an older girl, but it it was definitely um it was heartbreaking. And the only thing that really kept me um kept me from really losing it was having a baby. So that that was good. You know, I had a, my son and then a newborn. So I was I was certainly busy um and preoccupied with with that. But I, I truly, truly missed her. Um, so years had passed, um, and I, I went on to have three more kids. Um, so I have five all together. Uh, I'm one of five. I have five kids. We have five dogs here. We have five cats here. I mean, five seems to be a um, number that that continually finds me no matter what. Believe me, I don't plan it that way. It's just it's just the way that it is. And it's a good number. Who doesn't like the number 5? It's a good number. But anyway, um <clears throat> it was it was a lot having five kids. Um I also was a college student and then after college I started a business. It was a residential and commercial cleaning service that I had for 22 years. Um we had a family home. We had, you know, a bunch of kids and activities, including two boys playing travel ice hockey for, you know, two different teams and also for the school team. So that was that was a lot. Um, so it's not that I didn't think about getting another German Shepherd. Um, I just didn't have time. Uh, we did have a small cockapoo. 
Um, her name was Conchetta, but we affectionately referred to her as Kinchy. And we got her in 2000. And I mean, she was a great little dog. All the kids loved her. I mean, everyone loved her. Uh, I guess the only bugaboo about Kinchy was, you know, <clears throat> our yard was fenced in and we had a gate on both sides of the house. And obviously with five kids and a pool in the backyard, there was constantly kids coming out of our yard and leaving the gate open and Kinchy would, you know, follow the kids out. And of course the kids would go do their thing. And then Kinchy would be up and down the block and down the street and the next block over. <laughs> and I wouldn't, and then she'd, you know, come back to me because some neighbor kid brought her back a couple of times. The police brought her back. <laughs> it was bad. Um, <clears throat> it got to the point where the police said I was going to get fined. Because, you know, Kinchy was out running the neighborhood again. So I mean, that was that was the only bad thing about um, Kinchy is she she would not stay in the yard. She was she was super independent and she was going to do her own thing and she didn't care who liked it. So uh, I guess it was um, 2004, later 2004. Um, now, my, some of my kids were older, you know, they were they were teenagers at this point and uh, one was even driving. And um, so, you know, things had eased up for me a little bit in terms of responsibilities, although I did still have my business, which was which was tough. Um, you know, if anybody owns a business and actually works it, you know, especially a, a cleaning service, you know, people don't show up and you got to fill in and all that stuff. So, I mean, I, I could easily be out, you know, five, six days a week, sometimes 10, 12 hours a day. Um, but not all the time. So I guess it was late 2004. Um, my son started talking about uh, this dog, this great Pyrenees puppy he saw and he loved, and it was just so cute. And, and it was like, oh yeah, I mean, that is, that is really cute dog. I went and I saw it with him. It's like, yep, that's adorable. That's really cute, but that's a really big dog. And that's a farm dog. And, you know, we have like this little postage stamp yard, you know, with a pool in it. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that's going to work. Plus it's a lot of hair. So I guess, uh, just him talking about it kind of got the wheels in my head turning about getting another German shepherd. And my husband saw an ad for black German shepherd puppies. So in February, 2005, we went and we saw these black German shepherd puppies and lo and behold, he got me a black German Shepherd puppy for Valentine's Day that year. Now, I don't ever recommend getting anybody a dog for a gift. I don't. But he did. He did. He got me this black German Shepherd. And her name was Lady Levi Jane. And Levi came in and again, just like Maxine, this adorable little puppy, only she was she was bigger. She was bigger at seven and a half weeks old than Maxine was probably at 10 weeks old. And um, she was way bigger than our cockapoo, who was who was full grown, and she was just this big baby, you know, <laughs> big black ball of fluff, huge paws, big you know floppy ears, and and she was just this this baby in this big puppy body. Um, so Levi grew up to be this absolutely gorgeous black, almost blue, very muscular, very sleek, one hundred and ten pound female German Shepherd. And she stood 27 inches at the shoulder. And I'll tell you what, I mean, she was, she was impressive. Great dog, great dog, great personality, great disposition. She did everything right. Super smart. Um, she was, uh, human friendly. She was dog friendly for the most. I mean, she was, she was very fair, but firm. She would never attack another dog, but if a dog approached her in an excited fashion, she would lift up her right paw and smack him with it. <laughs> it was just like a boxer. Bam. She'd smack the dog with her paw. So that was kind of funny. Um, <clears throat> we socialized Levi at a very early age. Um, my husband actually started walking her. The, the minute she came home, he started walking her, trying to walk her. And he would he went this certain route around a block. Um, and, and he would inevitably end up coming home carrying her. And this went on for a while where he would carry Levi, you know, most of the way around her walk. Um, I had kids in school that were, was eight doors down the street. Um, I would walk down to meet the kids or at least my youngest son, Tristan and Levi would come. And so she would get exposure to all the kids, cars, other dogs barking, you know, all kinds of exposure. 
And as she got older, we we extended her walk to it's like a mile one way um two times a day so she was she was going for quite a few walks we would take her down to the main street um so where there was lots of noise lots of activity buses all kinds of stuff and she was exposed to a lot so i noticed right away with her as she got bigger that um you know, to me, she was still that adorable little puppy. And of course, people who knew her, which a lot of people did, they would come running up to her. Kids, they were super excited. Adults would want to see her and pet her. But then people who didn't know her would literally cross the street. (laughs) They would literally get out of our way because of this big black German shepherd. Um, So yeah, lots of people were uh, frightened by her. I even heard several times, oh, she she reminds me of the dog from the omen. Is she a bad dog like that? And I think, oh God, how stupid. I mean, talk about discrimination. It's it's in, it, it happens in the dog world too. Uh breed biasm, you know, black dogs, people just seem to have this this uh preconceived notion about black dogs. It's not very good. It's it's ridiculous. So we tried to educate as many people as we could. Um Anyway, backing up a little bit, in in the summer, it was June 2005, I went down into town for a festival that was happening, and I didn't take Levi because if anyone is familiar with July (laughs) in the suburbs of Philadelphia, you know it's probably about 95 to 100 degrees with 100% humidity, hazy, hot, and humid. Uh, So no, I wasn't taking Levi. I mean, I barely went myself, but I really wanted to go because I, there were some vendors there I wanted to see. So anyway, as I was down there, I came across a booth for a German Shepherd rescue. There were no dogs. They didn't have any dogs there because it was hot. And to make a very long story short, I decided to volunteer for this group. Um, And I did. I had no time, really, just no time. But, you know, here's the good thing about ADHD. I can have a lot of irons in the fire at once and be able to manage just fine. So uh, for years and years, I thought ADHD was a curse. But once I learned how to work with it, I realized, oh, wow, I can get a whole lot more done than most most people. So, um, yeah, join join the rescue. Um, I became very active. And one thing I didn't do was I didn't foster uh, because I I really just didn't feel like I could take on another dog um, with my business and, you know, other things in my life. Um, But but that's something I noticed in the group. You know, if there was 30 volunteers, there was only about the same, you know, two or three or four people actually fostering, which wasn't which wasn't great. I mean, there was a lot of dogs in need and no one stepping up to foster. So that was something that was eating away at me. I kept thinking like, I'm going to have to step up here and foster this. You know, I can do all the fundraising events. I can do other things, but you know, I'm going to have to step up and, and foster eventually. So in December, 2007, a volunteer was at the Burlington County SPCA in New Jersey Um, evaluating a German shepherd who was there when Woody came in. And she, she sent out this email. She sent a picture of Woody. He, he looked like a statue Um, and he, he wouldn't make eye contact with the camera. And I was thinking the first thing I thought was there's something, he's not a big German shepherd. He, he's a, he's like kind of a, a smaller German Shepherd. He was like in the, in the seventies. So he was a a smaller German Shepherd. I mean, I was used to Levi who was 110 pounds and, um, he didn't have like a big broad chest. There was something strange about his eyes. I couldn't make up what, make out what was up with his eyes and, and his nose, his nose didn't look right to me. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at the picture and it was kind of blurry. So I really couldn't make out all the details, but, his backstory was his person was in the military and he was being deployed and Woody had turned nine, in, you know, that past October, October 2007, and he didn't have anyone to take Woody. And from what I understand, it was a very, very mo- emotional um, departure for him from Woody, knowing that, you know, he he had to have known he was sealing his fate, that here's this nine-year-old, you know, a uh, definitely older looking German shepherd. And, you know, here he's surrendering him to this sh- shelter who's already full. He, he, 
probably thought he was going to be euthanized. So anyway, she sent the email out. And of course, you know, it was crickets. Um, nobody was offering to foster Woody. And I, I, I just couldn't stop looking at the picture. Um, I, I just couldn't imagine what this older dog, he was the first older dog that I had come across that had been surrendered. And I, I just couldn't imagine what he was, what, what was going through his mind. I mean, it, it bothered me seeing every post about a dog that needed a home, but it particularly bothered me that this older dog was being surrendered like that. So the next day, another email came in, same deal, you know, this one a little more urgent with explanation points and capital letters and all that stuff. And I just had a knot in my stomach. I was thinking this dog is going to die. He's going to die. And I I just don't know if I could live with myself if that happens. I mean, I immediately I'm thinking, why is no one stepping up? And then I realized, you know, like what they say, well, I'm someone. I should be stepping up. I should stop wondering why no one else is stepping up and wondering why I'm not. So the next day, um, I came home from lunch. It was Friday. It was my busiest day. It was a 12-hour day. And I was uh, I went to the computer. And sure enough, third email, like super urgent that he was going to be euthanized. And I, I just found myself typing back saying, I will take him. Um, I will foster him. If somebody can go to the shelter to pick him up and keep him for the night, I will, I will foster him. Um, and fortunately, another volunteer who lived in New Jersey was able to go get him and keep him at their house overnight till my daughter and I could drive down to New Jersey the next day to get him, which we did. Um, so what was weird about Woody's eyes? I was able to f- figure it all out <laughs> pretty much when I saw him. He had panis scars about halfway up his eyes. Uh, if you don't know what panis is, it's a brown cholesterol-like substance that builds up on the lens of the dog's eye, and it's caused by an autoimmune disease. Now, once the scars are there, they're pretty much there, but there is medication from prohibiting um, new uh, scars to form on the eye. So, yeah, that's that's what was weird. Like, there was really no white to his eyes because um, it had been covered with panis. The thing with his nose was it was either caused by an autoimmune disease or he scraped it a lot, but he literally, the the black on his nose was kind of gone in like the middle of his nose. And it was, it was like discolored, like a pinkish, um, like pale pink color. And that, that really didn't come back, but that's okay. Um, he had horrible breath. Oh, his breath was kicking. And he had teeth that were ground down. I mean, his teeth were like a sharpest spoon. So I don't know if he chewed on rocks or if he was kept in a crate and he chewed on the bars or what, but his teeth were almost non-existent. In fact, he had um, trouble with kibble. So we had to deal with that. And his back end was like, it was tiny. He had like a little chicken butt compared to, you know, his chest, which really wasn't that big. And I, I kind of laughed at it at first, like, wow, he's really disproportioned. But I later realized that he had degenerative myelopathy and that he had already started to um, emaciate in the back end. Um, I mean, he got around. He got around for several years, but, you know, he wasn't lighting the world on fire. Um, so, yeah, he he had a, a tiny back end, and I was hoping to be able to rebuild some of the muscle mass um, to keep him going for as long as possible. So, um, so yeah, we got him home. We introduced him to the other dogs. Um, him and Levi became inseparable. They were best friends. They took all their walks together, ate near each other, slept near each other, took rides together in my truck, um, trips to the Poconos together, played in creeks together. You know, they, they were inseparable. Um, so we moved then from the suburbs of Philadelphia to northeastern Pennsylvania. We moved to like the very northern edge of the Poconos. Uh, some people didn't even call it the Poconos there, but it was. So we moved there. And, um, the first night we, we were in our new home, Woody bloated. (laughs) Yay. Right. So that was really hard, um, driving in this torrential downpour in a very rural area to this 
ER vet that I really don't know where it is. And surprise, surprise, it's like 40 minutes away. Um, Fortunately, I recognized that he was bloating almost immediately and started to give him gas X to help. Um, We got to the ER vet. And they were certain he was going to die. I'm, I'm not even going to get into this. We'll save it for the next episode. He survived. But um, that really did a number on him with the degenerative myelopathy. In fact, he he really started to decline after that. Um, and I do, I do want to save that for the next episode. Um, I will say that Woody was a fantastic dog. I, I adored him. And he was also great with everyone. Um, he did live... Uh, till February 2011 and saying goodbye to him was one of the hardest things next to Maxine and Levi that I that I ever had to do um and my experience with him changed the trajectory of my life I mean as a kid if someone was to say what do you want to be when you grow up I would have never have said oh I want to I want to operate a, a dog sanctuary. <laughs> I I never would have even thought that was a thing, to be honest with you. Uh, I didn't even know there was a need for it. But um, I do now. And again, he changed the trajectory of my life. And I'm not upset about it. I'm not sad. I thank him every day for it. Um, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to serve all of these senior German shepherds in my care. So I, I do want to wind down here. Um, it's been about a half hour now, and, and I want to save more for the the next few episodes. So if you've hung in there with me this long, thank you so much. I really do appreciate it, um, and I look forward to sharing more with you during this first season of our Origins Um I also want to let you know that moving forward, again, each season is going to be different. We are going to have guest speakers on, um, and and we will have more informative topics, such as um, health issues that senior German shepherds are prone to, or food issues, or even cognitive issues, things like that. So um, this first season, again, it's about origins, but then we're going to be moving on from there. So Just want to say thank you so much for tuning in. I know there's like a billion podcasts out there. And if you're listening, I really, really do appreciate it. And I look forward to to growing with you from here. So, all right. Until next time, be well. 